We're on the theistic evolution critique in the chapter entitled The Extended Evolutionary Synthesis. We've been going through the book Theistic Evolution. There's a shot of the uh, title page. Um, and uh, before we go further, I will point out, as we pointed out before, that uh, there are several ways you can approach um, the, uh, approach the question of origins. You can go with young life creationism, various forms, maybe young earth as well, maybe young universe as well, um, but certainly young life. Or you can go with what's traditionally labeled an old earth creation, which is a slight misnomer because usually they mean old life as well, but I will use the old traditional way of putting it. Um, then we come to what I would call intelligent design theistic evolution. That is to say, God did it. He did it in a uh, sort of uh, evolutionary way, gradually changing things, or perhaps in some cases more suddenly, but that if you look at the f fossil record, if you look at the changes that are required, it is evident that there had to be some kind of intelligent designer. Now you, to be technical, you couldn't say for sure that you know it was God. Could be an angel, could be some superior civilization, but if you go far back enough, you're going to wind up with God. Um, then there is what I would call non-ID theistic evolution. That's the idea that God set up the process, maybe he interfered a little bit, but if he did, it was always inside of parameters where, uh, where scientific laws are inviolate, and you really can't tell. And so, from the point of view of predicting the phenomena, you are effectively saying that the atheists have it right. And then, of course, you could go with the atheists themselves. The book that we've been reviewing specifically is not aiming for uh, is not aiming against atheistic evolution, although it kind of gets caught in the crossfire. Um, what it's specifically aiming at is people who believe in God, but who believe that he set it up and then just let it go, or at least didn't interfere detectably. And so um, the, all of the predictions of the atheistic evolutionist are true. That's what's being aimed at. I believe in God, but I believe he did it through evolution. Now the chapter we're uh, doing right now is by Stephen Meyer, Ann Gager, and Paul Nelson. This is the first chapter we've had with multiple authors. And uh, it's in part one, the scientific critique of theistic evolution. So we're dealing with the first of three parts. It is section one of the first part called The Failure of Neodironism. And the full title of the, um, uh, of the, uh, of the chapter is uh, Theistic Evolution and the Extended Evolutionary Synthesis. Does it work? That's the question we'll be trying to answer. Uh, in the front, there's a summary which corresponds to abstracts in many uh, scientific journals. Uh, for nearly two decades, many evolutionary biologists have been working to formulate new theories of evolution, in part because of the recognition that neo-Darwinian mechanisms cannot explain the origin of living things. These new ideas supposedly have more creative power than mutation and natural selection alone. So even if you shoot down natural selection and mutation as the way to, uh, to explain things, now we have something extended, so maybe we can uh, uh, keep a belief in naturalism regardless of the, of the deficiency of neo-Darwinian mechanisms. This chapter will examine these new evolutionary theories and mechanisms and will show that the so-called extended synthesis has, not, has also not succeeded because it does not account for the origin of biological form and information. The extended synthesis leaves unanswered many of the same problems as neo-Darwinism, 
and raises the same question to theistic evolutionists. Why insist on synthesizing Christian theology or a biblical understanding of creation with a scientifically failing theory of origins? But of course, in order to do that, you have to establish that, in fact, it is a scientifically failing theory of origins. And so that's the plan. It will establish that, and then it will ask the question, why are we trying to mix this? Introduction. Charles Darwin knew that his young and ambitious theory of 1859 needed help. By the time of the sixth edition of The Origin of Species was published in 1872, Darwin had gone far beyond the elegant simplicity of the process of random variation and natural selection. So extensively did Darwin modify his theory, in fact, that the sixth edition contained many hundreds of entirely new sentences, making the last edition nearly a third again as long as the first. The project of reforming evolutionary theory started by Darwin himself has become an ongoing, even flourishing industry. Throughout the 20th century and now into the 21st, biologists have proposed one revision after another to Darwin's core concepts of randomly arising variation being sifted by natural selection. Consider just uh, one such proposed revision. In October 2014, the science journal Nature featured a print debate under the title, Does Evolutionary Theory Need a Rethink? With eight prominent evolutionary biologists answering in the affirmative and calling for an extended evolutionary synthesis, which is where the title of the chapter came, to remedy the shortcomings of the standard neo-Darwinian theory. Elsewhere in this volume, we and other authors have explained many of those shortcomings. And for those of you who've been here before, you've run into a few of those uh, shortcomings. Elsewhere, uh, pardon me, uh, could the new EES, e however, overcome the problems with the standard theory? Moreover, the skeptical scientists writing in the issue of nature mentioned above are no, by no means the only scientists doubting the creative power of the mutation selection mechanism. At a recent, as November 2016, conference of the Royal Society of London called largely to address problems in the standard theory, Austrian evolutionary biologist Gerd Müller began the conference by outlining the explanatory deficits of neo-Darwinism, including its inability to explain the origin of phenotypic complexity and the origin of phenotypic novelties. This is somebody who is, you might say, an evolutionist, but he says the standard theory just won't hold water. He and co-author Stuart Newman have elsewhere argued that neo-Darwinism has no theory of the generative. Other biologists have explained that mutation and selection can account for the survival, but not the arrival of the fittest, that is, minor but not major changes. Accordingly, many evolutionary biologists, including many present at the Royal Society Conference, are now attempting to develop new theories of evolution based on various newly proposed me evolutionary mechanisms as part of an extended evolutionary th synthesis. So does this new EES solve the problems associated with the standard theory? Many theistic evolutionists have argued as much, and that's why the chapter is felt to be needed here, and have appealed to the hopeful promise of the EES. After acknowledging weakness in the standard theory, Wheaton College philosopher of science and theistic evolutionist Robert Bishop argues that under the revised framework of the EES, while the overall picture of evolution is still one of variations filtered by natural selection, new discoveries show how the developmental biology mediates between the functional biology of gene expression, cells, and anatomy, and the changes in gene frequency of evolutionary biology. These findings will lead to a more adequate theory of evolution overall. In short, Bishop concludes, uh, the more accurate picture of the evolutionary and developmental biology literatures is that ev evolutionary development and epigenetics, along with other sources of genetic variation and natural selection, are being forged into a new synthesis, giving us insight into how both microevolution and macroevolution happen. Now I'm gonna skip over uh, uh, 
paragraph. I'm not going to read the whole thing, obviously, otherwise we'd have no time for discussion. We'd probably run out of room to read the whole chapter. But wherever you see green ellipses, that's where I'm skipping. In this chapter, we examine the claims made on behalf of the extended evolutionary synthesis. We show that the problems with standard evolutionary theory, or SET, an acronym devised by EES proponents themselves, persist in another form within the extended evolutionary synthesis because those problems actually stem from the materialist foundation shared by both SET and the EES. Textbook theory and the EES are, at day's end, not so very different after all, meaning that the reforms promised by EES advocates do little or nothing to open up biological inquiry where it genuinely needs a thoroughgoing, deep, and comprehensive reformation. That such a reformation is needed is stated by EES ad advocates in the plainest possible language. Evolutionary biologist Adi Livnat, for instance, at the Institute of Evolution at the University of Haifa, writes bluntly of SCT's explanatory failures. The modern evolutionary synthesis, what we've been calling EES, leaves unresolved some of the most fundamental long-standing questions in evolutionary biology. What is the role of sex in evolution? How does complex adaptation evolve? How can selection operate effectively on genetic interactions? More recently, the molecular biology and genomics revolutions have raised, and we're continuing to quote, have raised a, ho a host of critical new questions through empirical findings that the modern synthesis fails to explain. For example, the discovery of de novo genes, the immense co conser constructive role of transposable elements in evolution, genetic variants and biochemical activity that go far beyond what traditional natural selection can maintain, and uh, perplexing cases of molecular parallelism, and more. And I would add conservation of, uh, of sequences that don't appear to have a significant uh, uh, activity. But while many of the new mechanisms described by proponents of the extended evolutionary synthesis describe real biological phenomena, including phenomena not captured by neo-Darwinism, each of these proposed new mechanisms still fails to explain the origin of the genetic and or epigenetic information necessary to produce new forms of animal life. Thus, the questions we pose to theistic evolutionists who appropriate the neo-Darwinian mechanism will apply equally to theistic evolutionists who appropriate the EES. If the evolutionary mechanisms posited lack the creative power to produce new biological form and information, why say that these mechanisms represent God's way of creating new forms of life? The three pillars of neo-Darwinism and the EES alternatives. The neo-Darwinian mechanism rep rests on three core claims. First, that evolutionary change occurs as a result of man random minute variations or mutations. Second, that the process of natural selection sifts among those variations and mutations, favoring those that increase fitness, that is, confer greater reproductive success, and eliminate those that diminish the fitness of the organism that possesses them. And third, that favored variations in the comp competition for survival are passed on and inherited in subsequent generations of organisms, thus causing the population to change or evolve over time. Keep that in mind. Those are the three pillars. Biologists John Gerhardt and Mark Kirshner call these three elements variation, natural selection, and heritability the three pillars of neo-Darwinian evolution. We shall organize our discussion of the extended evolutionary synthesis around these three key premises of the standard theory. In one or another respect, the diverse proposals made under the EES heading depart from these premises, either singly or in combination. Yet, we will argue that in, doing, in so doing, these proposals do not solve the problem of the origin of biological information, either genetic or epigenetic, necessary to build novel forms of life. To see why, let's examine several of the new mechanisms that have been proposed, either to supplement or replace the mutation selection mechanism of standard neo-Darwinian theory. New theories of evolution, the EES alternatives. 
A, evolutionary development of biology, or sometimes known as evodivo. Standard neo-Darwinian theory since the 1930s has emphasized that large-scale macroevolutionary change occurs as the inevitable byproduct of the accumulation of small-scale microevolutionary changes in gene frequencies within populations. That's the standard theory. The consensus in support of this idea began to fray within evolutionary biology during the early 1970s when young paleontologists such as Stephen Jay Gould, Niels Eldridge, and Stephen Stanley, and yes, it is that Stephen Jay Gould, realized that the fossil record did not show a pattern of gradual micro to macro change. In 1980, at a now famous symposium on macroevolution at the Field Museum in Chicago, the rebellion against the neo Darwinian consensus burst into full view, exposing what developmental biologist Scott Gilbert called an underground current in evolutionary theory among theorists who had concluded that macroevolution could not be derived from microevolution. At the conference, paleontologists who doubted the micro to macro consensus found allies among younger developmental biologists. They were dissatisfied with neo-Darwinism in part because they knew that population genetics, the mathematical expression of neo-Darwinian theory, sought only to quantify change in gene frequency rather than to explain either the origin of genes or novel body plans. Thus, many developmental biologists thought that neo-Darwinian theory did not offer a compelling theory of macroevolution. To formulate a more robust theory, many developmental biologists urge evolutionary theorists to incorporate insi insights from their discipline. And indeed, by the beginning of the 1990s, a wave of books and articles on evolutionary developmental biology, or evodivo, swept through the evolutionary world proposing the idea that evolution did need not pro proceed by only by incremental small-scale mutations. Instead, Evo Devo av advocates emphasize that mutations in the genes that control animal development might have a disproportionately s large effect on animal development and thus could also play a significant role in modifying animal body parts. Small change and you could suddenly have a hopeful monster, basically. Evo Devo advocates thus broke ranks within, with classical neo-Darwinism, primarily in their understanding of the size or increment of evolutionary change. Because they think that mutations are expressed early in the development of animals are necessary to alter body plan morphogenesis, they argue that mutations must have played a significant role in generating large-scale change and indeed whole new animal forms during the history of life. Some Evo Devo advocates, such as Sean Carroll and Jeffrey Swartz, have pointed specifically to homeotic or Hox genes. So does the Evo Devo approach explain the large scale changes in biological form or the origin of new animal body plans? Major but not viable, viable but not major. Despite the enthusiasm surrounding the field, evolutionary development of biology fails. And for an obvious reason, the main proposals of the evolutionary developmental biologists that early acting developmental mutations can cause stable, heritable, large scale changes in animal body plans contradicts the result of a hundred years of mutagenesis experiments on organisms such as fruit flies and nematodes, or roundworms. As we saw in chapter two, the experiment of scientists such as Christiane Nusselin Volhard and Eric Weishau, uh, Weishaus, uh, Nobel Prize winning work, by the way, observed that early developmental mutants never hatched as larvae. You mutate them, they die. Moreover, the same proved true of other species that have been studied from the nematode to the mouse. Major change is not viable, viable change is not major. What about Hox genes? Hox are homeotic genes encode proteins that regulate the expression of other genes during animal development. Because they influence a pattern of development along the head to tail axis of the body, specifying different structures in different body segments, many evodivo theorists think that Hox genes can be mutated to generate large scale changes or macro mutations in animal form. For example, Jeffrey Schwartz says, we are still in the dark about the origin of most major groups of organisms. They appear in the fossil record as Athena did from the head of Zeus, full-blown, 
and raring to go, in contradiction to Darwin's depiction of evolution as resulting from the gradual accumulation of countless infinitesimally minute variations. His answer to this conundrum is to claim that a mutation affecting the activity of a homeobox or Hox gene can have a profound effect such as turning larval tunicates into the first chordates. Clearly the potential homeobox genes have for enacting what we call evolutionary change would seem to be almost unfathomable. Again, that's a quote. Excuse me. But there are several good reasons to doubt this claim. First, precisely because Hox genes coordinate the expression of so many other different genes, experimentally generated mutations in Hox genes have proved harmful. As McGinnis and Kurziora note, most mutations in homeotic or Hox genes cause fatal birth defects. The Antenopedia mutant, one of those Hox genes, cannot survive in the, in the wild. It has difficulty reproducing and its offspring die early. That's one where you get legs in where the antennae were supposed to be. Second, Hox genes in all animal forms are expressed well after the body plan is established. In fruit flies, by the time that Hox genes are expressed, roughly 6,000 cells have already formed. And the basic geometry of the fly, its anterior and posterior and dorsal and ventral axes is already well established. For this reason, Hox genes do not and cannot re determine body plan formation. Uh, Eric Davidson and Douglas Irwin made comments to that effect. Thus, the primary origin of body, animal body plans is not a question of Hox gene action, but of the appearance of much deeper control elements, what Davidson called the core developmental gene regulatory networks. Hox genes don't go far enough. Yet, as we saw in chapter two, Davidson has demonstrated that altering developmental gene regulatory networks invariably shuts down the embryological animal development in animals. Basically the same problem that uh, uh, Weishaus and uh, uh, Nussbaum, or whatever her name was, uh, said. Um, Third, Hox genes only provide information for building proteins that function as switches that turn on other genes, turn other genes on and off. The genes that they regulate contain information for building proteins that form the parts of other structures and organs. The Hox genes themselves, however, do not contain information for building these structural parts. In other words, mutations in Hox genes do not have all the genetic information necessary to generate new tissues, organs, or body plans. You'd have to also create all those other proteins. Thus, mutating them could not possibly generate new forms of animal life, not without the extra information. And uh, uh, then there's self-organization. Another attempt to modify standard neo-Darwinian theory has also gained prominence in the 1990s as a result of the work of a group of scientists associated with the think tank in New Mexico, called the Santa Fe Institute. The scientists there developed a new theoretical approach they called self-organization. Uh, I think that quote is not, does not belong there. Uh, self-organizational theorists uh, suggest that biological form often arises spontaneously or self-organizes as a consequence of the laws of nature, or what he calls the laws of form. Self-organizational theorists See natural selection acting uh, to preserve the spontaneous order that self-organizational processes have generated. Thus, they especially de-emphasize two of the three parts of the classical Neo-Darwinian triad. Uh, most they de-emphasize as random mutations, but to a lesser extent, natural selection as well. Stuart Kaufman in The Origin of Order. Stuart Kaufman wrote an influential book called The Origins of Order, Self-Organization and Selection and Evolution, in which he gave an incisive critique of the alleged creative power of the mutation and selection mechanism, making some criticism similar to those described in chapter two of this book. Those parts could have been lifted straight from an intelligent design uh, advocate. He offered ideas for how self-organizational laws could account for the origin of the first life and the later development of the first forms of animal life during, during the Cambrian explosion. 
Kaufman notes that present-day organisms' gene regulatory networks influenced how different types of cells are differentiating during embryological development. So he's kind of appealing to Evo Devo here. They do this by generating predictable pathways of differentiation, pathways by which one type of cell will emerge from another over the course of embryological development, giving rise to multiple types of cells, some becoming heart cells, some brain cells, some gut cells, for example. Kaufman suggests that these pathways of differentiation may reflect self-organizing features of complex genomic regulatory networks. I'm going to skip over a few things here. Kaufman again points to known processes of body plan development during embryogenesis and suggests that similar processes could have played an important role in the formation of the first animal body plans. All interesting theory, all also general theory you'll note. Do the self-ordering processes that Kaufman cites, or laws of form if they exist, explain the origin of animal body plans and the genetic information necessary to build them? They don't, and for two reasons. First, Kaufman's self-organization theory does not explain the origin of the genetic information present in genetic regulatory networks that he himself argues are necessary to cell differentiation. Where did that information come from in the first place? Instead, he begs the question as to how the information present in these regulatory networks might have originated. Indeed, though Kaufman discusses cell differentiation as a kind of self-ordering or self-organizational process, he acknowledged that the predictable pathways of differentiation that characterize this process derive from pre-existing gene regulatory networks. And the question is, where did they come from? Second, Kaufman's attempt to explain the origin of positional or epigenetic information lacks specificity and chemical plausibility. His model is entirely hypothetical. You have X and Y and no actual examples. In a later book, At Home in the Universe, Kaufman does suggest two models to demonstrate how self-ordering processes might generate positional information. But both of the models suffer from the same difficulties. First, neither is biological realistic. One uses buttons and strings, and the other flashing lights to make the demonstration. Not actual organisms or DNA sequences. Order versus information. Self-organizational theorists face, in addition, a conceptual distinction that has cast doubt on the relevance of their theories to biological systems. Nice theory, but it doesn't actually work in biology. Self-organizational theorists seek to explain the order, origin of order in living systems by reference to purely physical or chemical processes or laws describing these processes. But what needs to be explained in living systems is not mainly order in the sense of simple repetitive or geometric patterns. Instead, what requires explanation is the adaptive complexity and the information, genetic and epigenetic, necessary to build it. Yet advocates of self-organization fail to offer examples, examples of either biological information or complex animal anatomical structures arriving from physics and chemistry alone. Probably because it doesn't exist. Self-organizational theorists often point to simple geometric shapes or repetitive forms of order arising from or being modified by purely physical or chemical processes as if such order provided a model for understanding the origin of biological information or body plan morphogenesis. Self-organizational theorists have cited crystals, vortices, and convection currents or stable patterns of flashing lights to illustrate the supposed power of physical processes to generate order for free. Well, yeah, order but not information. To see the difference between order and complexity, considering the difference between the following sequences, and I'm going to compress this a little bit. Uh, there's order, sodium chloride crystal. There's complexity, but it doesn't mean anything, and it could be different, and nobody would really care. And there is specified complexity. And the uh, examples kind of speak for themselves. Michael Lynch's neutral theory of evolution. So we've finished that section 
we're going on to neutral evolution. Michael Lynch, a noted evolutionary biologist at Indiana University, has proposed another EES theory to explain evolution from a non-Darwinian point of view. Interestingly, whereas in self-organizational evolutionary models, random mutation plays a relatively minor role, in his account of evolutionary change, natural selection plays a minimal role, whereas minor variations are now back up to uh, a major role. Instead, neutral, unguided, non-adaptive processes like mutation and genetic drift are the forces responsible for evolution. At least in eukaryotic organisms such as ourselves and other large multicellular organisms with relatively small populations. Why should that be? Lynch's theory is based on the equations of population genetics. Equations of population genetics suggest that for organisms of smaller population sizes, including most multicellular organisms and animals, natural selection will have difficulty overcoming the effect of random genetic drift, meaning that the beneficial mutations are likely to be lost before they can become fixed in a population, and that natural selection will not efficiently remove many slightly harmful mutations. Um, that sounds vaguely like genetic entropy. What does this have to do with macroevolution and the origin of new forms of animal life? Evolutionary biologists think that the ancestral groups of most new forms of animal life would likely have existed in small populations. Given the relatively power, relative powerlessness of natural selection to remove extraneous DNA in such populations, Lynch argues that additional genomic elements would accumulate over time and the genomes of animals and plants would tend to grow in size. And I think that that directly implies that there would be a lot of junk DNA. Lynch argues this, that this accumulation of DNA would lead to increasing complexity in both the genome, the total DNA, and the phenotype, the observable characteristics, of these organisms, which would over time drive significant evolutionary change. This is his contribution to the extended evolutionary th synthesis. The paradoxical aspects of Lynch's theory. Lynch has provided a powerful critique of the e efficacy of the neo-Darwinian mechanism. Again, very much like some of the other people, it doesn't work. Showing mathematically that natural selection essential to standard evolutionary theory does not have the power to fix beneficial mutations and thus generate new, tra new traits in small populations. So Sanford is not out of order in pointing this out. It does not follow from the failure of selection, however, that the accumulation of random mutations that Lynch proposes can do the job either. Although, if you are stuck within a box of it had to happen by random mutations without a designer, if you shoot all the other games in town down, you can claim that yours is the only one standing. Skipping over a bunch of that because it's almost uh, a self-refuting theory. Uh, we come to D, Neo-Lamarckian epigenetic inheritance. The third element of the Neo-Darwinian triad concerns the transmission and inheritance of genetic information. Not surprisingly, the new element of the extended evolutionary synthesis we describe next questions the Neo-Darwinian understanding of heredity, just as alternative theories have questioned the other aspects of the Darwinian triad, random mutation, uh, as in self-organization and evolutionary development, developmental biology, and natural selection, which uh, near neutral evolution challenges. Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, believed in the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Lamarckian mechanisms, although unsupported by any evidence at the time, came to play an increasingly important role in Darwin's thinking, as criticisms of natural selection caused him to place more weight on the direct influence of the environment in evolutionary change. Darwin turned out to be a Lamarckian, believe it or not. Indeed, by the sixth edition of the origin, Darwin specifically emphasized the importance of these modes of inheritance. But with the rediscovery of Mendel's laws in 1900 and the identification of chromosomes as the material entity responsible for the transmission of inheritance, uh, 
and later on uh, the DNA in those chromosomes, um, Lamarckian theories of inheritance fell out of favor. Recently, however, as more biologists have recognized that some biological information, epigenetic information, see chapters 2 and especially 7, resides in the structures outside of DNA, interest has grown in the possibility that these non-genetic sources of information may influence the course of evolution. Today, prominent defenders of neo-Lamarckism include Eva Jablonski of Tel Aviv University and Massimo Piglucci of the uh, City of University of New York. According to Jablonka, neo-Lamarckism, I'll get that right eventually, allows evolutionary possibilities denied by the modern synthesis version of evolutionary theory, which states that variations are blind, are genetic, nucleic acid based, and that saltational events do not significantly contribute to evolutionary change. Saltational events are hopeful monsters. Jablanka has collected several categories of evolution in support of what she called epigenetic inheritance systems. In the first place, she notes that in some single-celled organisms, such as E. coli and yeast, environmentally induced changes in metabolic pathways can be transmitted to the next generation independently of any changes in the cell's DNA. Second, she notes that structural information mediating organismal form and function does pass from parent to offspring independently of DNA via membranes and other three-dimensional cellular patterns. We covered that in chapter seven in some detail. Third, she discusses processes such as DNA methylation. Finally, she cites a process called RNA-mediated epigenetic inheritance, a recently discovered phenomenon. Here, small RNAs, again acting in concert with special enzymes, affect gene expression and chromatin structure, and these modifications appear to be heritable independently of genes. So you fix the genes, you haven't fixed the whole problem. Can any of these mechanisms help to explain the origin of animal form? Not really. By its nature, evolutionary evolution requires stable, meaning permanently heritable changes. But Jablonska's evidence shows that where non-genetic inheritance occurs in animals, it, it involves structures that either A, do not change anyway at all, such as membrane patterns and other persistent templates of structural information, or B, do not persist over more than several generations, which means they disappear and you're right back to where you started from. Neither case generates significant evolutionary innovation in animal form. Instead, for directional evolutionary change to occur in a population of organisms, changes must be not only heritable, but permanent. Stability, the irreversible, or essentially irreversible, and enduring heritability of traits is a logically inescapable requirement for any theory of evolution. This is precisely what descent with modification means. And here Jablonski's evidence for stable non-genetic inheritance is equivocal at best, as she readily admits. Jablonka, uh, Jablonka candidly addresses this last lack of evidence for stability, noting that we believe that ep epigenetic variants in every locus in eukaryotic genome can be inherited, but in what manner, for how long, and under what conditions has yet to be quantified. So we don't actually have a complete theory there. And finally, the most interesting variant of them all, natural genetic engineering. University of Chicago geneticist James Sapir has form formulated another post-Darwinian EES perspective on how evolution works that he calls natural genetic engineering. Shapiro has developed an understanding of evolution that takes account of the integrated complexity of organisms, as well as the importance of non-random mutations and variations in the evolutionary process. This represents a radical change to the idea of random mutations put forward by the standard evolutionary theory, and thus is another example of the EES. Shapiro observes that organisms within a population often modify themselves in response to different environmental challenges. He cites evidence showing that when populations are challenged by different environmental stresses, signals, and triggers, 
Organisms do not, uh, do not generate mutations or make genetic changes randomly, that is, without respect to or unguided by their survival needs. Instead, populations often respond to environmental stresses or signals in a directed or regulated way. As he explains, the continued insistence on the random nature of genetic changes by evolutionists should be surprising for one simple reason. Empirical studies of the mutation of process have inevitably discovered patterns, environmental influences, and specific biological activities at the root of novel genetic structures and altered DNA sequences. Why insist on the random nature of genetic changes? Because if it's non-random and it's directed, it starts to sound a lot like intelligent design. The depths of Sapiro's challenge to orthodox neo-Darwinism can hardly be overstated. He favors a view of the evolutionary process that emphasized pre-programmed adaptive capacity or engineered change, where organisms respond intelligently ooh, to environmental influences, rearranging or mutating their genetic information in regulated ways to maintain viability. As an example, Shapiro notes that, contrary to the neo-Darwinian assumption that DNA alternations are accidental, all organisms possess sophisticated cellular systems for proofreading and repairing their DNA during its replication, equivalent to a quality control system in human manufacturing, where the surveillance and correction functions represent cognitive processes rather than mechanical precision. This is getting risky. As an example of regulated mutation, Shapiro observes that in response to environmental assault, UV damage from sunlight or the presence of an antibiotic, for instance, bacteria activate what is known as the SOS response system, where specialized error-prone DNA polymerases, that's the enzymes that copy DNA, normally left unexpressed, are synthesized and set into action. So you have two sets of DNA uh, replicators, one of them that does a really, really good job and maintains uh, genetic information well, and one of them that kind of makes errors periodically. And uh, the second one is suppressed, and there's an actual uh, uh, protein that suppresses them. And uh, and then when they're under stress, that protein disappears and they start using the uh, mutating ones. From Shapiro's perspective, this survival strategy does not exemplify Darwinian randomness, but rather sophisticated pre-programming, an apparatus that even the smallest, cell, smallest cells possess to maintain viability. What's more, the carefully regulated expression of the SOS response provides evidence that cells employ the system only when needed. Skipping over a bunch of uh, what it says, which is all fascinating work, and if you uh, want to get more into depth, I recommend that you read the book. Where does the programming, the algorithmic control that accounts for the pre-programmed uh, adaptive capacity of living organisms come from? We know of only one sort of such programming. Our uniform and repeated experience affirms that the only source for information-rich programs is intelligent agency. Or as the information theorist Henry Kossler put it, the creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious and rational activity. Uh, Shapiro and other proponents of EES remain firmly committed to purely naturalistic or materialistic explanations. Stuart Kaufman, Michael Lynch, Eva Jablonski, and Charles Marshall would flatly exclude any consideration of an intelligent cause as the explanation for the origin of the information necessary to produce novel forms of life or animal body plans. Yet, as we have seen, they also repeatedly presuppose the origin of information-rich systems either genetic or epigenetic or both, without explaining how such information arose, presumably originally by intelligence. 
the current situation. The same difficulty was everywhere noted in evidence at the Royal Society meeting in London in November of 2016. At that conference, several new mechanisms and models, including neo-Lamarckism, pardon me, neo-Lamarckian epigenetic inheritance and natural genetic engineering, Shapiro's baby, um, were discussed as possible remedies for the explanatory deficits of neo-Darwinism. Notice the explanatory deficits are obviously there. Nevertheless, the conference failed to offer any new mechanisms that could help remedy the main deficits of the neo-Darwinian synthesis, its inability to account for the origin of phenotypic novelty and especially the genetic and epigenetic information necessary to produce it. Of these presentations, James Shapiro's talk was clearly one of the most interesting. Shapiro reprised his case for natural genetic engineering. He presented fascinating evidence showing the non-random nature of many mutational processes, processes that allow organisms to respond to various environmental challenges or stresses. The evidence he pre presented suggested, as noted above, that many organisms possess a kind of pre-programmed adaptive capacity. Yet Shapiro again did not explain how the information inherent, inherent in such a pre-programmed capacity might have originated. Other mechanisms, they talk about a niche construction and they deconstruct and I would have to agree with their deconstruction. The evolutionary accounts of niche construction theory therefore collide repeatedly, as do all the other ones, with a brick wall marked original complex functional capacity required here, without which or beyond which there would simply be nothing interesting to observe. Indeed, the new mechanisms offered by critics of neo-Darwinism at the Royal Society Conference, whether treated as part of an extended neo-Darwinian synthesis or as the basis of a fundamentally new theory of evolution, did not attempt to explain how the information necessary for generating genuine novelty might have arisen, where the original information come from. Thus, even a science reporter friendly to the EES, Susan Mazur, complained in the Huffington Post of a lack of momentousness. Just what was the point of attracting a distinguished international gathering if the speakers had little new science to present? Why waste everyone's time and money? Conclusion, a timid reformation that leaves us where we were. And this one I'll read in toto. The metaphor of a city bounded by a high wall helps to illuminate the situation now faced in evolutionary biology. Despite the difficulties with standard theory that proponents of the extended evolutionary synthesis acknowledge, there are weaknesses, they know that. EES theorists remain fully neo-Darwinian in the essential sense that separates them from proponents of intelligent design or special creation. Uh, notice that last word, Name, or last two words, namely their, view, their views about the ultimate source of biological form and information. EES proponents assume that novel form and information must arise from only natural, meaning physical, or material wellsprings. It is not imparted to the biosphere by an actual purposeful intelligence, or more precisely, we may not infer that biological information has an intelligent source, at least not one external to the evolutionary process itself. Such, influence, such inferences would, in their view, violate the rule of methodological naturalism. And for those of you who are looking forward to it, we're going to cover that in chapter 19. Uh, methodological naturalism defines the walls of the city bounding scientific explanation proper. And intelligent design, that is, real teleology involving an actual purposeful intelligence, lies beyond those walls. Thus, while the proponents of the extended evolutionary synthesis urge openness to new ideas on the part of the standard evolutionary theory establishment, and can be blistering in their critiques of textbook theory, they stay obediently within the city walls. Indeed, the walls of methodological naturalism are high and impassable, and for most evolutionary biologists, ever in sight. Most never consider leaving the boundaries defined by methodological naturalism. 
Hence the problem created by accepting it. In particular, the problem of explaining the origin of information for which we know of only one cause remains unsolved. One can only accomplish so much within those walls. But why should it be the case that the walls stand so high when every proposal of the EES can be shown to fail as well as the SET and methodological naturalism is clearly presenting consideration of other more causally adequate, plausible, and fruitful ideas. Surely someone is willing to scale the walls to see what might lie on the other side. And this is the money quote at the end. And why specifically should theistic evolutionists who already presumably believe there is something on the other side of the wall remain behind it? Now, my take on all this is that standard evolutionary theory, the Darwinism is proposed, composed of three parts, variation or in the Darwinian terms mutation, natural selection and inheritance of the results of that process. Uh, standard evolutionary theory in fact explains some phenomena well. White animals in the Arctic, for example, or woolly animals in the Arctic. There's a reason why mammoths had long fur and elephants don't. Um, but standard evolutionary theory does not explain well the origins of body form and the origins of information. It just doesn't. And the EES attempts to explain these things better by challenging one or the other of these basic assumptions of standard evolutionary theory. And I think they do expand the theory around the margins. But they are not nearly a complete explanation. The obvious alternative is intelligent design. Theistic evolution believes in an intelligence that created the universe. The question arises, if it appears to be necessary after the universe starts, that is, in the origin of life, the Cambrian explosion, why should we say, but God wouldn't do that and therefore rule it out? Why insist on effective materialism between the miracle of the creation of the universe and other miracles in salvation history? Why not just acknowledge what we see is really what it appears to be. But that's my opinion. <laughs> now it's your turn. I, uh, I, I marvel that we got all this information right there for us uh, to read and to think about, uh, I just wanted to add one little possible problem that uh, these folks seem to stay at a certain level, the origin of life, uh, yet you can originate all the life you want. If it can't reproduce, you're not going to make a go of it. And uh, when you talk about the oxygens, you talk about Evo Devo and so on, and Saltation, uh, you come to uh, an argument that has been raised a long time ago, and that is supposing you have an organism that by, you know, uh, embryological change, you know, we talk about these animals with two heads and uh, things that affect uh, development, but uh, <coughs> they're talking about perhaps earlier things here in, in genetics. Um, what if you have an animal out there that, by saltation, developed a, an, a wing instead of an arm? Mm-hmm. So, well, okay, could happen, you know. That m animal has to have a mate in order to reproduce. And uh, yeah, I think uh, reproduction is a thing we need to go into, or at least consider, in this whole equation here. Well, that's, that's a further problem with, uh, with the, the thesis. Well, you, you have to do it by pairs as well. Um, and you see, if God's involved in the process, then he could produce the mate at the same time. But the whole point of this was to keep God out of the process. Um, yes, uh, Jack. Uh, 
I'm, I've had a little problem with the terminology and the way it was used today. Uh, it seems like, if I understand uh, what we're talking about today, in order to avoid the ironclad boundaries of philosophical naturalism, they have conflated uh, methodological na naturalism with philosophical naturalism. <laughs> And I say it for this reason. Uh, in my understanding, methodological naturalism uses the best of science, which really means you set hypotheses in a format in which it is possible to refute them, which is totally outside of the boundaries of, of this kind of discussion. And it means ba basically philosophical to the core. Well, that's the problem, is that methodological naturalism, unless you're very, very careful in how you define it, tends to turn into philosophical naturalism pretty easily. Or perhaps it was a stalking horse for philosophical naturalism the whole time. See, and that's, uh, I, I mean, I can see a methodological naturalism that says, as a first hypothesis, maybe as a second and third, um, I'm going to assume that everything is following natural law. And in fact, we all instinctively do this kind of thing. You know, if, uh, if we see something over on the other side of the room that looks like a person, our first assumption is not that it is a ghost or an angel or some other uh, non-natural phenomenon. Um, The problem with methodological naturalism is that if you insist on it as the only possibility, you have then moved to philosophical naturalism. Exactly. Um, and that's a really, really important thing. Um, and that's why it gets attacked is because, you know, it kind of walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck but people don't want to call it a duck. Well, it is. Well, from what you talked about this morning, I heard nothing that could be proposed as a hypothesis that was testable. And it was testable is the critical part of that statement. It simply is outside the boundaries in my view of what I consider methodological naturalism to be. Well, I think that the, there is actually something testable. And I think that this is important. And that is that, for example, if you find information and you find everywhere that you see information that there is an intelligent cause behind it, except for the phenomenon that we're studying, in this particular case, life, it is reasonable to ask, is that also due to intelligence? Because, uh, uh, because we don't have another explanatory theory and because intelligence adequately explains it. And, and so now you have a, a, a testable hypothesis because it's based on two premises that are testable. Number one, can you show that uh, complex information can come from something other than intelligence. If you could, the argument would collapse. Um, and that means it is testable. And, and the second one is, can you show that there is complex information of, in a, of a similar type, and obviously it's not going to be exactly the same, but it but the closer the parallel, the stronger the argument can be made that there is that kind of information in biological systems. 
And that's a testable hypothesis. It could be wrong. Uh, and in fact, many people believed it was wrong for 90 plus percent of the genome at one point. That all that stuff was not, in fact, um, uh, anything more than junk. And the fact that we're finding out more and more, and not just in terms of specific instances, but in terms of percentages. Uh, in other words, the estimates for, uh, for useful information in the genome has gone up from of around 10%. Uh, remember, <laughs> The popularizers even shrink it down to three. That's Dawkins, et cetera. And you can quote him, but 97% of the genome is junk. Um, but the, uh, the professionals would say 10%. They would have said 10%. Uh, Dawkins is stretching it a little bit. But it's gone up to around 80%. And the people who know what's going on are saying, and Maybe the other 20% is important too, we just don't know yet. Well, at that point, we're starting to look at predictions of intelligent design that are in fact being fulfilled, that could have not been fulfilled. We could have found out that in fact there, there is no, or at least no detectable, See, the interesting thing of it is what makes intelligent design a testable hypothesis is precisely the point at which theistic evolutions, uh, theistic evolutionists in general wimp out. It is not just that there is design in the universe and design in life, but that it's detectable design. And that's what makes it predictable. But that, that still leaves a huge amount open to interpretation of what's there and what's testable and what isn't. Well, of course it does. And that means that you're gonna to have to get to the nitty gritty of the facts on the ground and you're gonna to have to start looking at the genome and you're gonna to have to say, and this thing has a function and this thing has a function and this thing we don't have a function for at this point. My point exactly. Uh, you illustrated this beautifully earlier with the homeotic or Hox genes. As you pointed out, has been pointed out, Hox genes don't build anything. They choose between alternatives. Right. The crucial thing that uh, you never hear in this discussion among the evolutionists is that there has to be some independent building of that suite of genes. For before example, before they're ever needed. Yes, before, like in the the famous example of a mutation taking a uh, the olfactory mechanism of an insect and change it to a leg, mm -hmm. without acknowledging that if you're going to do evolution, the first invertebrates had only legs. At least that would be the theory. Oh, well, uh, as far back, as we uh, go, know, we've never found fossils go, go, that only had legs. Well, go back. Well, I'm sorry. Um, I think the Cambrian has some pretty good examples. Uh, I, I, won't, I won't go into the details. Well, insects? Pardon me? Insects that only had legs? Invertebrate. Yeah, yeah. That one I would agree with, that, uh, that one could argue that, for example, trilobites Exactly. did not have antennae. Exactly. And something had to allow some descendant to build antennae separately before the choice of choosing between antennae or legs became available. Interestingly, this dramatic experiment that is often used to illustrate salt, saltatory evolution goes backwards. It the, the uh, mutation goes from a more adaptive, specialized function backwards to what, to what, in their theory, could have been expressed in every segment. Yes, and the same thing can be said for four-winged fruit flies. That's exactly what I was referring to. Yeah. 
that, I'll, I'll be, that you, you actually lose information rather than gaining it. And the, and the next question is, which came first, the Hox gene that allowed the antennae or the proteins that were going to make up the antennae? I, wanna, I, I want to come back to that next week. <laughs> yes. Okay, comment here. And then I think we have one here, and we did have one up there. Uh, you want me to go? Or go? Uh, go ahead. No, you go okay. ahead. And uh, cause well, I appreciate the an analogy here. of the high wall because I have friends that are behind this high wall, and I get stonewalled when I try to talk to them. But I, I kind of like the idea that all these scientists, and I actually appreciate what they're doing because eventually, maybe they're going to throw up their hands and say, "Oh, I guess there is intelligent design here." But. Uh, <laughs> I kind of think of the analogy that's also used in scripture that we can make the analogy that uh, God's enemies, God would throw confusion at them and then they'd just start fighting amongst themselves and, and destroy the, the whole apparatus. So. Yes. Now, by the way, I should point out some of you are intending to go to Second Church and you may want to take this at a time to uh, 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 Get ready to head there. Very quickly, I, it's my understanding that me methodological naturalism has its limitations interpreting historical sciences. So um, you can ask questions and have some hypotheses, but with historical sciences there is limitations to prove them because we don't have the cause and effect or fully, you know, the, the, the mechanisms that have caused certain phenomena. So what we see now is just what we see now, and those evidences, the pieces of evidence we see, either in geology or genetics, um, is, you know, the interpretation of that can be, can be twisted in, in any direction, evolution or even creation or intelligent design. So I think the methodological naturalism in hypothesis testing is, has its strengths on exact science, like describing uh, phenomena that we, we can see now. But with historical science, is my understanding, there's a lot of limitations with methodological naturalism, such as origins. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say that it's the inference to the best explanation, the idea that um, that that if you're staying inside the the wall you can't explain it intelligence does explain it even though it's uh, an explanation based on a sort of a negative finding in other words since intelli since nothing but intelligence can explain this that's the best explanation so the inference to the best explanation is a logical process mm -hmm. Well, it, we actually use this kind of thing in medicine in a different way. He's got a... Uh, um, we, we use findings that are what are called pathognomonic. You have this, you have the disease, because nothing else does this. And, and basically what it's saying is that the creation of information is pathognomonic of intelligence. And you can challenge that if you want to. You can say, well, no, actually we can show you that here it was with something else. But as long as you don't challenge it, then it is indeed the best explanation. And the fact that there is such a thing as intelligence, I think, is indisputable. And anyone who wants to dispute it is making a self-referential incoherence. Yeah, just, just a little more speculation on this methodological naturalism. Atheism is uh, often defined as actively promoting or stating at least that there is no God. Uh, methodological naturalism uh, tries to alleviate the uh, stigma of um, atheism to a certain extent by saying, well, uh, this is God, but I'm, I'm not going there. Yeah. And in doing that, they're doing exactly what the atheists do. They're promoting atheism. 
not as strongly, but effectively acting the same way? Well, again, most of us actually operate on a kind of mythological naturalism. It's just not a hard one. But if, you know, if we see really reliable reports of somebody who was raised from the dead, whose body by historical standards disappeared, who appeared to people, some of whom were not believers to begin with, including his brother, um, then uh, the best explanation for that is that in fact something happened that does not happen under normal circumstances. That is to say, a miracle. Or another way of putting it is a violation of the principle of methodological naturalism. And if you have methodological naturalism as something that will say, okay, you know, if after multiple attempts to explain this under other circumstances fail, maybe we'll have to concede the possibility that it could. That's a kind of a soft methodological naturalism. Then you can get there. If you have a hard methodological naturalism, no amount of evidence would ever convince you because you know that certain things just don't happen according to the laws of nature. Well, there's a problem with that kind of hard methodological naturalism at the beginning of the universe. Something happened that where the laws of nature didn't even apply because they didn't, in a certain sense, exist. You can't divide by zero. And if you come to, if you explain that by some kind of thing that's outside of the universe, and then you come to the origin of life for which certain phenomena happen that don't have an, ep uh, an explanation of that kind. And then perhaps later on you see that in the, what is called the Cambrian explosion, you have, again, information appearing out of shall we say, nowhere. And then you keep working at this, eventually you're going to have to come to the conclusion that methodological naturalism is not maybe a complete theory. Once methodological naturalism stops becoming absolute, then you can't exclude intelligent design. As long as it is absolute, you don't have methodological naturalism. You have philosophical naturalism. And that's the difficulty that we're facing. And what the book is basically showing is that all of the extensions of the evolutionary th synthesis are not good enough to change that. Do you have a comment? Or? Uh, I'll say it real quick. Here, we'll get, we'll get this to you. As a non-scientist, as a perpetually uh, beginning theologian, nothing like a theologian to, to mess the whole thing up. Nothing like a theologian to kind of bring it back again. And so I sit in class sometimes from where I sit, and, and we start going into the deep weeds, and I, I don't see where we're headed. Uh, and then a scientist, another one talks, and all of a sudden I'm coming out of the weeds again. So I, I like these kind of discussions because it shows me that God has a path for hard questions, for uh, hard answers that may not always be uh, uh, available to me right off the bat. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate the questions and I especially appreciate you of bringing it back down to my level, mm -hmm. something well. I can understand. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, comment here. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate the uh, discussion of theological thinking that you mentioned, and I do marvel at uh, uh, watching theologians uh, uh, operate and uh, redefine things and so on, and, and I think, is there a parallelism between them and what a lot of scientists are doing when they're playing around with methodological naturalism, atheism and other things, and redefining evolution and redefining science? Uh, this is a theological game, it's also a scientific game. Yeah, well. There, there are significant parallels between what scientists do and what theologians do. As somebody who lives on both, side of that, both sides of that fence, I appreciate it more than perhaps some do. Um, next week, we're going to get to hear how people dealt with uh, the question of creation and evolution and the interactions between the two uh, from the perspective of the Andrews University Biolo Biology Department. And uh, so uh, we would be grateful to Jack Stout to introduce us to that subject. And um, so come, you'll, you'll, you'll get a refreshing change from what I do.